jobs stands for just overboard. There are only opportunities. The paycheck is given to people who show up, but opportunities are given to men and women who think and work beyond what they're paid to do. In the future, you will be paid for the difference you make and the experience you create. If you're not creating an experience as to why someone should do business with you. Hello and welcome everybody to the next series of our People Hum Leaders Hum series. Just a quick introduction of People Hum. Uh, it is an end-to-end, -end, one view, integrated human capital management automation platform. The winner of the 2019 Global Cody Award for HCM that is specifically built and crafted for employee experiences and the future of work with AI and automation technologies. Uh, we run the People Hum blog and a video channel specifically targeting leaders and young leaders uh, through our Leaders Hum series. And it is indeed a pleasure for me to welcome Simon Bailey today. Um, Simon is a speaker, teacher, author, a consultant, and a coach. He believes that his purpose is to spark listeners to lead countries, companies, and communities differently. He has more than 30 years of experience in the hospitality industry, including service, uh, serving as a director for um, the Disney Institute. He has worked with almost 2,000 organizations in over 50 countries. The editors of Direct Selling News selected him as one of the top 20 motivational speakers to inspire, educate, and motivate. Wow, indeed, a pleasure to have you uh, today with us, Simon. Well, it's so good to be with you. Thank you for having me. Absolutely, great. So let's just jump in and maybe, uh, Simon, you could help our audience. Um, tell us a little bit about the Simon T. Bailey International uh, that you run and, and, and the type of work that you do. Yes. So think of us as a multi-channel content distribution company. So I've written over 10 books. Uh, we have over five online courses. We partner with LinkedIn Learning and our courses have been viewed by people in 100 plus countries. Uh, specifically around building business relationships, leading through relationships. And then uh, I speak all over the world, obviously virtually now. I did get a chance to go to Europe a few months ago to be with a client in Switzerland. And then we provide executive coaching and consulting uh, to different organizations who are really looking to transform their cultures and have sustainable results. I see. Great. And in your introduction, I kind of found it uh, very interesting because I was reading about it and, you know, you talk of um, a, a very broad categorization, I would say, as you, you talk about, you know, helping people to lead kind of countries, companies and communities. And these all mm -hmm. seem very, very diverse. So uh, what are some of the traits that you see common across these and what are some of the differences that you, you've seen? Yeah, the commonalities that I think uh, that runs through all of these is trust, innovation, and excellence. When a leader is trusted, they don't have to ask men and women to work harder. People will automatically do it because that leader has built credibility that their word is their bond and you can take it to the bank. When we talk about innovation, uh, sometimes people want broadband results, but they're using dial-up methods. They're holding on to the way it's always been. So innovation is all about the intersection of insight and information. You can Google just about anything nowadays, but it's that critical insight that is the breakthrough in innovation. And when we talk about excellence, this is kind of with my Disney hat on. Uh, everything that Walt Disney really taught uh, before he passed away in 1966 still lives on in the company. Now, let me just say Disney is not a perfect company, but what is baked into the culture is that spirit of excellence, going the extra inch, never sat, uh, settling for the status quo, looking for an opportunity to surprise and delight guests. Uh, one little factoid that a lot of people don't know that the average family that comes to Disney saves three to five years of their discretionary income to come to Disney for maybe once in their lifetime. And a family of four in a seven day stay will spend about $10,000. So that spirit of excellence, critically important. 
I see. Okay. And, and you, you also have um, a publication, uh, if I'm not mistaken, called like Be the Spark, right? Yes. Uh, so could you, could you talk a little bit about that and the ideologies related to that? Yeah. Be the Spark is based on 30 years of research. My time at Disney, I did some work for the Ritz-Carlton Learning Institute, and we wanted to find out why do companies and brands continue to grow and have customers return year after year. And what we discovered is that organization has a spark. They have transferred psychological ownership to uh, a person in the organization, a man or woman, and they literally create an experience for every guest that they interact with. So Be The Spark is based on five principles that actually spell out the word spark. The S is see them as guests, commit to connecting with them. The P is personalizing the experience by individualizing the moments. The A is anticipate their needs through listening and observing. The R is respond and solve their problem and create a happy customer. And then the K is all about how do you keep them loyal with acts of kindness. So what we do is we unpack each of those principles to help organizations operationalize the how and the why in their culture. I see. That's fascinating. Actually, I, I do want to kind of go back uh, since a lot of our audience um, is typically like corporate, um, you know, people who want to be leaders and managers, like probably first time as well. And you talked about, you know, the three aspects and one of them, which I was kind of, um, you know, I was wondering if you would have tips to our listeners in terms of how do you go about creating that trust that you talked about, right? What, what tips would you give first time managers on how to go about trying to create that trust between themselves and the company and, and the employees? Yeah. So the first thing is uh, performance is the price of freedom. So once you perform in your individual role, you build trust that you can deliver the results. So be known as a person that if it's due on Tuesday, you have it done on Friday, the Friday before. Um, that builds trust. Be the first one to the meeting. If the meeting starts at a certain time, you show up 10 to 15 minutes early, build a rapport. Uh, if your manager or leader that you report to, go to them and ask them, what can I take off your plate? that you don't have time to do. What will happen is eventually that manager will look to you as a go-to person because you can take on things and get it done. Now, once you're promoted into a leadership role, building trust is sitting down with every person on the team, carving out 10 to 15 minutes, be it in person or virtual, to ask them about what's important to them, what's made them successful, and here's the last question, what can I do to best serve you? That last question, what can I do to best serve you, is saying that I'm coming alongside you to help guide you, not tell you. Uh, the other interesting thing to remember is that real leadership is about uh, leading change. Everything is managing the status quo, but you can't change everything the moment you take over a team. You have to find out who are the champions, who are the early adopters, who are perhaps the naysayers, and then begin to change with their commitment and support. And uh, do you think as, you know, the entire world has gone through this one year, uh, you know, which was something that no one has experienced before, right? Uh, and do you think we have seen a lot of kind of like changes that have occurred uh, which where these leaders or, or in order for you to build trust, you need to do things differently or what is your opinion about it? Yeah, I think what the pandemic has really shown us, which leaders uh, really see us as a human being instead of a human doing. Which, which leaders have begun to understand the value that we bring into the workplace not just can we get rid of labor because we want to increase our bottom line. Um, I think what the pandemic has done has forced every organization to say, does it matter? Is it still relevant? And if not, how do we reimagine it? So individuals must begin to say, 
Am I a person that the organization would fight to keep? Even leaders uh, have to begin to say, how have we shown up during this pandemic? Because a pandemic doesn't come to break you, it comes to reveal who you are at the core. And if you didn't care about your people before the pandemic, now all of a sudden you don't get a conscious and a heart that you're gonna care about people, it's either there or it's not. And people know the difference. And uh, so, I, and I, I understand kind of what you are saying, um, you know, uh, these days, especially um, in, you know, a lot of people are talking about the employee experience, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, kind of thinking about um, the end-to-end -end kind of experience that the employee goes. And I think something that you referred to earlier that still, you know, kind of resonates with me is, uh, you know, in, in Spark, if I'm not mistaken, I think you, the P was all about personalization, right? Yes. Uh, now, I would be intrigued by what's your view in terms of, you know, a lot of large companies obviously have things, you know, written down in terms of here's the process. And, you know, when, when you are so large of a company, it's obviously very difficult to kind of personalize it, right? Because there are there are your policies and documents out over there. So what advice would you give uh, the people who are in these large organizations where they might say, you know, my hands are tied because I have to follow the process that's been laid out. So how do I personalize things? Yeah, great question. So first of all, every organization has a culture, but when you dig down into the organization, managers or leaders create a subculture. In that subculture, yes, you have your standard operating procedures, but there's also an opportunity to say, how do we improve based on the context that we operate in? So, so many times they're waiting for the message to come from the top of the food chain. And now if organizations are gonna move quicker and faster, it's gotta be bottom up. It's gotta be that person who is closest to the action, who says, this is what the rule says. But if we're flexible without breaking any laws, um, still operating appropriately and ethically, then we can make this better for the employees and for the customers. But so many times employees have to say no because a rule has been put in place and has never been revisited. And in that subculture, that, that person that has their ear to the ground knows what that end customer needs. So it's flexibility, being nimble, agile. That's how you begin to move forward and not wait for the tap on the shoulder. Right, very true. And um, have you seen or do you believe there are certain characteristics in certain companies where they are able to continue to be agile, nimble, and provide that flexibility versus for some reason, um, you know, it doesn't work in all companies, right? So obviously some are able to succeed and some aren't. And so what characteristics do you think would help define a more successful organization in some of those things? So I'll use Amazon just as an example. And I know there's obviously a lot of people who've looked at Amazon but I want to look at it from the standpoint of their values. One of their values is they obsess about the customer and they're constantly reinventing how they go to market uh, to speak to the customer. So you look at their acquisition of Whole Foods. Now they're in the grocery space and they're going to totally disrupt how groceries are delivered and picked up. Walmart now, because they bought Jet.com, they still live the values of Sam Walton, but now they're morphing into a company that's not just big box, but they're looking at how do we think in a different way if the customer comes to pick up things that they've ordered online. So it's this ability to look around the corner, I think is what keeps companies really relevant and being able to be um, uncomfortable being comfortable, letting go of what has always worked to let come what is emerging. Mm. Interesting. So uh, I had a question actually, like. Let's say a company is um, debating about, you know, what their core principles is. And one side of the table is saying, you know what, let's keep our customers first because, you know, as you gave the example, right? And, you know, customer first, customer centricity, that's what's allowed Amazon to be on top of things. 
and then there's another side of the table that says well let's do it the other way which is let's keep our employees first and if our employees are happy they're going to keep our customers first and they're going to make the customers happy uh and if you are mediating over there and the company says we want to pick one of them what 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 advice would you give those two sides on how to go about solving that yeah great question so the first thing i would do is i would build a bridge um from from both sides of the table where we meet in the middle and where we meet in the middle is leaders create the experience for employees employees create the experience for customers customers drive revenue reverse engineer revenue comes from happy customers who have been engaged by an employee who totally gets it who has been managed or led by a leader that believes in them so now we have the best of both worlds another little piece to throw into the mix there's a book called um uh oh just escape me right there uh oh firms of endearment Firms of Endearment is written by uh, three Babson College professors. I think two of them are professors. Another one is a consultant. And the central thesis of their book is that companies that will thrive in the next decade will put purpose before profit. So what I would invite both sides of the table to think about is what is our purpose? And our purpose is leadership, employees, customers. And if we take care of that purpose, then the profit will come. So it's counterintuitive. Purpose before profit. I see. Great. Awesome. Okay. Um, so Simon, a, a last question. Let's assume you know you are talking to the graduating class, uh, who are you know a coming out of a very tough year. They are senior year. You know, almost completely gone by. Uh, trying to fight the pandemic, um, they are coming into somewhat, some may argue, at least in some fields, a fairly uncertain world ahead of them, uh, in terms of you know stability, growth, job prospects, and so on. So, what would you tell the graduating class of 2021? Graduating class of 2021, number one, there are no jobs available anymore because jobs stand for just over board. There are only opportunities. The second thing I would tell them is a paycheck is given to people who show up, but opportunities are given to men and women who think and work beyond what they're paid to do. And then the third thing that I would tell them is in the future, you will be paid for the difference you make and the experience you create. If you're not creating an experience as to why someone should do business with you, then you will just exist. But I believe it is now the opportunity to begin to be what I call a, a multifaceted person that has range. You may understand a specific discipline, but be a cross trainer, a CrossFit thinker. You can understand marketing, but you can go over in operations. You can go to supply chain, but if you had to do some time in finance, that would benefit you as well. It is about range. So see yourself, class of 2021, as the CEO of you, Incorporated. And if you just happen to work for a company, great. But if you work for that company, create your own side hustle. So just in case the rug is pulled from under your feet, you're not left out in the cold. Wow, fascinating. Uh... Well, Simon, um, thanks, thanks a lot for taking uh, the time for sharing your insights. And I'm sure um, our audience is going to learn quite a few things from, from our chat over here. So do really appreciate you know, the time and sharing uh, with us over here today. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you.